So I'm Renee Casterline with the Siskiyou Land Trust, and I am excited to be here tonight with Sean Bullock, and we'll be talking about his film, The Last Wild Bison. And looking at the list of folks who are coming in, you know, I, and I'm pretty certain that some of you were part of the original slideshow that Sean did for us back in 2018, early on in the process of making this film. And so it's a really neat thing for us to get to come back to it, um, that the film's finished and that it's it's going out into the world. And Sean and I were talking about that just as um, we got started and Sean's hoping that he'll be able to do a screening here in Mount Shasta where we can all get together uh, live and in person and watch the film. And, um, you know, as Sean works on that and as it develops through the year, when there's information about it, obviously we'll share it with you because we all feel like you guys are a part of this and uh, and want you to um, to be able to to see the whole film and to have that experience of doing it together. So we'll be sure to share that information as it as it becomes available. So what I want to do is give you an idea of how this evening is going to go. It's a little different than our standard webinars in that tonight Sean and I are going to be chatting. You'll see the trailer to the film here in a few minutes, but we're going to spend time talking about the process and um, talking about, you know, his creative approach to this. So we'll go through a period of time with questions, and we've got a great collection of photos from Sean that we'll be showing in the background as he and I are chatting. While we do that, while we chat, you are all welcome to put your questions into the chat box or the Q&A. And at the end of the interview portion of the evening, then we'll go into your questions. So we'll have the opportunity to share those and hear back from Sean about those. I met Sean many, many years ago on the river. Um, well, actually we had met prior to that, but we spent time together on the river and that's you know really so much of what I associate with Sean and his time on the river and also his creativity. And um, you will have noticed that the film this film was made by Locks Media. That is Sean's company. Sean has just tremendous background in creating products that, you know, the Last Wild Bison is, Sean describes it as his passion project, but he also has his professional projects. And if you're interested in that work, you can go to the Locks Media website where you'll see some of that. You know, he's worked with GoPro. He has worked at the Tour de France. Um, definitely check him out there and Sean can share um, more with us in terms of how to see um, some of his other work. And we'll talk about this film in the context of, um, of the other work that he's done. So uh, there's a lot in store for us here tonight and we'll take the opportunity to um, hear a little bit. I'll ask Sean a little bit about his background and you know what brought him to this. So you'll hear more about that. And what I wanna do right now, we're, um, we're gonna flip some technology here. I'm gonna get the trailer up on my screen and we will start the evening off with watching the trailer for The Last Wild Bison. We heal a lot of these buffalo that died without proper ceremony, without surrendering their spirits. You know, the callousness that some parts of humanity have towards, you know, the buffalo. You don't need to handcuff her! Each of us has this unique thing that only we can give humanity, that only we can give Mother Earth. Everybody has this unique fire that only they carry in themselves. In some way, I am, um, you know, saying I'm sorry to all of the native peoples and the buffalo trying to make amends. We've been slaughtered too. We're, you know, we're still being slaughtered to this day by the policies that affect our Indian people. You know, from the poor health care to the lack of education to the lack of housing. We have all these other problems at home. And these things, they're tied to the, the, the life of the buffalo or the, the slaughtering and these plans, this, this federal management plan that affects them is the federal management plan that affects us. 
It's all about termination control and exercising the power they have because it's there rather than because it's right. You know, again, it just goes back to that thing of letting them know we're always going to be watching them. Yeah. You know, like they are going to be held accountable for they're what they're doing. Our restoration efforts have been so successful that it's created this conflict in the area surrounding the national park. You know, you hear about all these people who don't live with buffalo saying, oh, they're big and dangerous, they'll destroy this, the blah, blah, blah. Here's the perfect example of how people and wild buffalo coexist. If we can learn to work together, then we can do a lot of really good things. But I don't see that happening right now. <laughs> It really all starts before they even get here, making sure they don't feel overwhelmed or, you know, pressured. They're a part of this family. Wide open landscapes, they need access to their traditional homelands the same way that the tribes have been speaking where they need access to their traditional homelands. We all have these sacred places that need us there and we need to be there. Sometimes I think as people that maybe we're not exactly here to save the buffalo, but to like save us. A way to educate the people as to what we've lost by colonizing the Great Plains the way we have. We're teaching people how to make change in this world in a time where it isn't more needed than ever. You know? Sean, let me get my technology working and we will jump in. All right. So, Sean, you know, let's start off with the big question. You know, I know you traveled the world a lot um, in your youth and, and even now still. What led you to this topic and the decision to make a film about wild bison? Yeah, so I mean, thank you for having me, Renee, and to the Land Trust for putting these on. I think it's awesome resource for the local community here and, and uh, stoked to share part of my story. Um, I think with any film, it's never owned by one person. Um, and definitely this is a prime example of a bunch of really talented creative people coming together uh, to make this possible. So I would say uh, the opportunity to participate in this film came from a good friend of mine, David Miller, who was the writer on the project and really um, owned a lot of that relationship with the Buffalo Field Campaign, <clears throat> as well as his friends, Justine and Roman, um, that are on the board and really spearhead the operation out of the BFC. So. Uh, the opportunity to create the film was provided by David. He reached out and gave me some insight into how bison were managed uh, out in Yellowstone. Uh, obviously, it's a complicated place just because of how that park is situated between three different states. Um, <clears throat> I had previously had a lot of interest in just the history around wild bison, uh, given the magnitude of which they roam North America um, back in the day. You know, you're talking tens of millions of wild bison that were roaming from Virginia to Alaska. Uh, and those, you know, 10 to 40 million bison were slaughtered down to 23 animals. Uh, and those 23 animals are what make the central herd of Yellowstone today. So um, a lot of the parallels of how I feel native and indigenous peoples have been treated um, throughout history is kind of paralleled in this representation of how bison were managed and ultimately eradicated from North America as a war tactic. Um, so my interest in bison started uh, just in a love for animals and a love for uh, seeing them on the landscape. I remember seeing them in Yellowstone when I was maybe 20, and that was the first time that I'd seen them in person. But very much the opportunity to create this film wouldn't have been possible without David Miller. Um, he was very much the cornerstone of, of 
sharing that history as well as um, the the goals and ambitions of what the Buffalo fan, Buffalo Field campaign uh, were doing on the ground because you're you know, you're talking about one of the longest running activist groups in the country you know 25 years Patagonia grant recipients um, really walking the talk of doing the work on the ground so I would say that I was much more of a spectator of you know infiltrating this place for a, a week uh, or or so and uh, gleaning all that I could uh, and really going in there as a sponge uh, much more than a director I would say because uh, we were all you know out of our comfort zones living at the BFC um, working with them but really the the cornerstone of that's that story coming to life lived with David and he tapped me um, as a filmmaker to collaborate with him and bring the story to life. Super. Well, let's talk more about that because that is one of the threads for the evening is to talk about the creation of the film and, and what that looks like and what it took. So can you talk more about the, the, the creative team behind the film and sort of, you know, the array of people and talent and skills that you needed to, to bring this all together? Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, a lot of it speaks to um, people seeing the vision and identifying with the story. And I think that that, uh, none of this would have happened without that, but just running down the list, you know, myself and David wore many hats. Um, David was helping producing, uh, obviously on the writing front. He also did a ton of work on, on the sound design and musical um, development of it, because along with a 32 minute film, the soundtrack's completely original, um, which to score something like that and, and create um, that type of uh, environment for the footage to really sing. Um, got to give a huge shout out to David on, on that as well. And then my good friend, Jason Bukowitz, uh, who I met at GoPro uh, back in the day, 2014 through 16, I believe. Uh, he was based out of Salt Lake City and he was the principal animator who was responsible for the on-screen graphics as well as the opening animation. Uh, and, you know, it really spoke to why it took two years to do a 30 minute film, which sounds absolutely absurd when you say it out loud. <laughs> and I don't think this film particularly would have finished if it wasn't for COVID, um, just in terms of when it came down to getting something across the finish line that is a passion project. It is a much, it's a much larger struggle than it is to deliver client work because um, your client work, it just has to get done. It's brand, you're being paid to get it done at a certain time. And so you have compromises that you make within that process to make sure that they get the assets that they, that they want. In this circumstance, your only timeline is what you're holding yourself to and you want your mm -hmm. art to be what it is in your mind. And when you get two years down the road, that shifts and it evolves and you're looking at a product that you're like is this even good or like did I totally mess this entire thing up and I'm just like <laughs> sitting here in this hamster wheel watching the same thing over and over so um, a lot of it was people not only donating their time but not compromising on the quality of what they wanted to see you know and that that was you know obvious with myself and David um, and Jason was kind of the prime example of you know, I, I paid Jason what I could, but it definitely was not an animator rate. It was very much like under the table. Like, I just want to give you something that I can to compensate for your time. But Jason was pretty much done with the animation about a year into the project. Um, and he learned so much in that time that, you know, when we were going back and forth of like what we wanted it to kind of be finalized as, he really took it upon himself to be like, you know, I've learned so much in this last year that I'd rather just go back and redo it. And so that's what he did is that he took this three minute animation that was pretty much done and went back to the drawing board quite literally and redid the entire thing over the next year. So um, those instances of people really rallying around, uh, not compromising the vision, not having outside money influencing or brand money influencing the, the story, um, and that was really um, special to be a part of because up until this point, you know, kayaking or brand content, like I really hadn't done a project like that. Mm -hmm. So having aligned creatives, um, David in my corner, really putting, putting a lot of effort into crafting the story and going back and recrafting. And he flew out here from North Carolina and lived here at the house for about a week and a half. Um, and it was also an intense time because it was right when Leaf died. 
Um, but it was just a really uh, everybody doing going above and beyond to like give you know to the project, which was really special. Yeah, thanks for sharing that insight. And then I'm gonna um, ask you about the timeline. So you said you spent about a week out um, shooting, and you know we first saw you in 2018. So what's the the large scope of this timeline look like from inception and talking ideas with David to getting to Yellowstone and spending time there and then coming home and doing the work. And and I guess um, beyond that, also, I think, was it in 2020 that the film became available through certain platforms? Yeah, so that is a long timeline, but I guess the yeah. breakdown would be, uh, we shot the entire thing in five days. Um, and that was myself, David Miller, Josh Thomas, who's also a local here, who donated his time and equipment and, and rallied out there with us and embedded and, you know, really fun to feed off of Josh as well, because, um, you know, he made a pivot from a uh, career in, in helicopter piloting into media and film. Uh, so getting to work off of him and, and teach and learn and uh, his, his uh, contributions to the project shouldn't be overlooked. And so that was the team that was out there it was myself, Josh, David, along with the Buffalo Field campaign, um, which is Mike Meese, Justine Sanchez, Ramon Sanchez. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty wild to think that you can shoot something in five days and then you're quite literally gonna spend the next two years working within that footage um, and crafting the story. So I'd say the, the film that we had laid out in that first year was, um, it was sweet, it was long. We were back and forth whether to try to push it into a full feature into about an hour, hour 15. We opted to keep it a short form doc with the hope that we were gonna you know, submit it to film festivals and have this whole you know, distribution plan that was in a pre-COVID world. Um, and obviously as COVID developed and, and the world was shutting down and definitely in the film space, uh, nothing, you know, we weren't packing theaters by any means. So that process for better or for worse drew out um, the post-production and obviously between the day job and, and just finding the creativity or the the flow of that creativity is challenging you know some people can do it on on command and they're very creative right out of the gate and they can channel that and you know for others like myself like I kind of have to be in a zone and then when I'm in that zone like I'll go for you know 96 hours straight and barely sleep and get it done <laughs> but it's not not a healthy way to do it but I think what COVID did um, was really shake up what we and what I had preconceived as a distribution plan of this film and where it was going to go. And, you know, David very much had this vision of doing presentations all over the country for colleges and, you know, uh, environmental groups. And really, when it came down to it, we, we had to figure out an entirely different path for it. So, um, you know, I'd say the front half was absorbed by not a lot of time dedicated to the project. And then the back half was very much uh, dealing with COVID, figuring out how we would finish it, but then also reclaiming a lot of that time um, that I had to actually just get in the trenches with it and commit to getting it done. And then ultimately uh, what got it done was submitting to Sundance. Uh, and that was a kind of like a life goal, not that I actually thought that it was going to get in or, you know, do super well in the scene. It was more to hold myself accountable of, you know, coming at this project and reading the script and being like, I think that we have a shot and I want to submit it. So uh, it was more accountability than actual seeing that being the path for it. So um, yeah, I think it taught me a lot about what, what we want from our art. If we're, you know, if you're creating something and you're trying to make money from it, your influences and uh, you know, what's going to motivate you and that project's going to be different than if you're really trying to share something that is about the story. Um, and it's about sharing a part of history that hasn't really been highlighted. And so that process of submitting to Sundance led to submitting to about 10 to a dozen other festivals in the same vein of the what you'd call blue chip festivals of the Tribeca's and the mountain films and uh, you know, what I saw as the, the tier one 
uh, film festivals. And that was met with all closed doors, which is hard, but also uh, a big piece of the project of, of how you overcome that adversity and then tailor um, what your original vision was to what you really want. And what it really came down to, for me at least, I know David really wanted that tour, um, but in my mind, it was like, how do we get this film, you know, in in every household in the world that has an internet connection and a TV? Uh, and so that led to more OTT style um, streaming platforms and ultimately landed it on Roku uh, streaming as well as Tubi, which is an app that is available in Amazon Fire Stick, uh, Apple TV. It's also available on web browsers. Um, and then it also got, you know, in that process got picked up and got some traction with the Redford Center, which received a fiscal sponsorship, which, you know, ultimately we didn't end up making a lot of money or raising a lot of money around the film. Um, so that fiscal sponsorship was more of a feather in the cap of that, you know, the Redford Center, Robert Redford, the founder of Sundance, their institution um, really saw value in it and wanted to uplift it. Uh, and that was really um, fulfilling and also just kind of lends itself to you really got to face, you know, dozens of closed doors before you're going to find that open one. And if you quit, you know, halfway through those closed doors, then you'll never get to the open one. So even though it was a different distribution path than what I wanted to see for it, it was still really special to uh, not have much of a barrier to entry. Nobody has to buy the film. Everybody can watch it for free. Um, and, you know, making the priority, not making money from the film and, and having that priority being sharing the story and, and just letting people watch the art with nothing, no strings really attached to it, I think gives uh, an extra level of purity in the project, which is pretty rare. Wow, there are a lot of pieces there that I'm super interested in. And, um, and I want to go back to um, sort of an earlier piece you know, when you went out and spent time in Yellowstone, what was that like? Share with us a little bit. I mean, you know, there's 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 the geography and the setting, but there are also the people and working with a topic that seems challenging in a lot of different ways. So if you could sort of talk to those different aspects, just you know, what it was like to be there and to be filming and sort of what those conditions were like, but then even more so connecting with people. And, and you've mentioned already David's connection. What did that look like to spend a week with folks on the front line? Yeah, so I mean, Mike Neese and the entire Buffalo Field Campaign were very open arms of letting us come in and, and really ingrain and embed with their activist group that really no journalists or filmmakers had ever done. You know, we were quite literally um, sleeping in the bunks that the volunteers sleep in and we're in that scenario you know so from uh, surface level I slept terrible and um, it was really gnarly long production days and not you know I think Josh probably felt the same way of that you know we were we were definitely burning out on both ends to try to capture what we could without having a real clear vision at that point of what the film was going to end up being um, but it was it was intense, you know. I mean, what these guys are doing is intense. These are literally the only people that are tracking bison, you know, all over, you know, where they're in Yellowstone, outside Yellowstone, and pretty much the only measure of security for wild bison because they're there. They record everything. Um, obviously, this picture on screen is of the National Park Service Rangers. Uh, Rick Wallen, who's on the right there, was uh, one of the main characters that we interviewed from the park side. Um, and there's a lot of animosity between park rangers and the activists, you know, they're, they're not people that like each other. And so the fact that we were trying to tell, you know, multiple sides of it, as well as obviously the indigenous side of James and uh, the Namipu and Nez Pierce Nation of what they've experienced in this place. Um, it was it was not an easy environment to try to stay relatively neutral and and you definitely feel the pull of you know, what's going on in the park is wrong. And that that's what we feel, but really trying, and, and David really did this within a lot of the interview process was trying to represent both sides in a way that tell um, that both sides aren't that far off, you know, even though they're at each other's throat and they are not fans, fans or friends of each other by any means, they ultimately still have the same goal for wild bison, which was really interesting um, in the overarching narrative of what was going on. So, 
the process of being out there was uh, humbling um, and challenging and ultimately led to what we got because the people there were willing to open up and work with us and realize that we were there to help and support and be champions for wild bison versus just going somewhere to uh, exploit and express the story. It was much more being a part of it and, and feeling those um, open arms of really trying to, to help us in the process of our own creativity and, and capturing and doing interviews and um, everything that we were trying to do while we we're out there. So um, yeah, a lot of sleepless nights and, you know, really no showers. Uh, it was just kind of a, you know, down and dirty, uh, you know, back up as much footage as you can and, and try to do the parts of production that would normally be expected to, to have all your data safe. But um, ultimately, it was really trying to sponge um, the experience and the wisdom and knowledge of, of the people in the BFC, as well as Rick, because even though he is somewhat made out to be the villain, if you will, um, he has a ton of experience with bison and he's seen them on multiple sides. And even though he's overseeing a lot of these slaughters of wild bison in and outside of the park, um, working with Department of Livestock and, and different interagencies uh, between the states, he still ultimately wants the same thing that the BFC wants, which is ultimately more public lands for wild bison to roam um, and them not to be persecuted just because they go outside the state boundary to Idaho where there's a no tolerance policy for bison at all and they'll be shot on site whether it's a baby, a pregnant mom, it doesn't matter. There's no management style on that side. And obviously a bison doesn't, uh, they don't recognize state lines. Um, so whether they go to Montana, Wyoming, or Idaho has fatal consequences for them. Wow. So in that time that you spent there, obviously you shot a lot of footage that you distilled down into 32 minutes. And then also, you know, had a lot of conversations and started building relationships. So a few questions there. Did you form lasting relationships with folks that you're still in touch with? And then I'm assuming that, that the, the key folks in the film who you spent time with, that they have seen the film. And if that assumption is accurate, can you talk about you know, those relationships you built and then also what that looked like when they saw this finished product about them and the work that they do. What did that look like? Yeah, so I feel fortunate that a lot of those relationships were lasting. You know, I've, I've talked to James as well as Mike uh, after the film's been done. Uh, I, I haven't stayed as connected with them as I would like. I know that David is, is probably in the closest contact out of all of us to Roman and Justine. This is Justine who's on screen right now, who's the president of BFC. Uh, and so he maintains really close contact with them. I talked to James a bit um, during COVID. Uh, Nez Pierce Nation out in, out, out in Idaho really got hit hard. You know, you're talking 180, I think, 80 to 100 of their tribal members died. Um, and, you know, when you're talking about a small indigenous community like that, you're talking about, you know, decades of history, you know, you're talking language, you're talking so many things that are being lost in that moment. So really sad um, what was going on out there. And also um, just really grateful because I think what James gave to the film and his wisdom um, and he's such a legend in terms of just his approach to life and how he sees the world. Uh, there was a lot to learn from him. So I was, I was just grateful to meet him and get to spend the time that I did while we were making the film. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get out there and, and show the film, but they all got to see it remotely. Uh, they were all super grateful and obviously impressed at the storytelling as well as the BFC being represented in that way, as well as the park. Um, because I think that that, if you watch much of the BFC media, it's very much from their lens um, and doesn't have a lot of the park integration outside of the atrocities that they are doing to wild bison. Um, but what I learned in interviewing Rick is that, you know, he walked a very fine line of somebody that obviously cares about bison, um, but is that regulatory um, decision maker out there that is deciding to call um, in the haze, you know, anywhere up to 30 plus percent of the herd every year. So it's kind of this 
dichotomy that you have because you have them selling you know fluffy bison stuffed animals in the park and they are very much the mascot of Yellowstone and then you have Stevens Creek capture facility that's about 35 miles outside of where the the gift shop would be where they're rounding up wild bison and, and killing them every year so um it's kind of a a really hard thing to 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 tell accurately because of how complicated it is and i don't know if rick's seen it i i haven't had contact with rick wallen since that original um, interview that we did um, but he ended up getting pushed out um, of the park service shortly thereafter so that interview that we got with him was quite quite possibly the last interview he ever gave um because it basically panned out that uh, the secretary of the interior at the time ryan zinke uh forced him out more or less who um like the superintendent of the yellowstone at the time was about a 20 25 year um tenure of working with the park and they didn't see eye to eye on on management practices for wild bison and so you had this whole mass exodus that left with that superintendent which included rick wallen so it was a pretty special conversation in hindsight to see because you know it was a few months after we left that david sent me the link to basically them leaving and having that conversation had different um, implications at that point after he left. And so what do you know about the situation now, years after you were there and filming? Have you kept abreast of things to know like, what the work looks like for BXC now, what the, what the park is doing? Yeah, so it's, it's, kind of unfortunately more of the same from what I've seen from the outside you know um, the BFC has kind of a revolving door of activists and, and volunteers because it's a completely volunteer run organization they're very much they'll take in anyone and you know they clothe you and feed you and you don't have any expenses while you live there and they the exchange for that is donating your time to to watch wild bison so um, it was a uh, it was a hard, hard piece uh, to, to figure out in that, that process of, of keeping in touch and, and figuring out what, what we could do to help. Obviously, we partnered with Kind Humans on the backside to create some t-shirts, and I worked with Mariah, uh, excuse me, Mariah, and she created some beautiful artwork. This artwork on the t-shirt is, is hers, and um, we were able to partner with Kind Humans to make these t-shirts and then donate that money to the BFC. Um, basically everything was trying to get, get pushed back to the BFC in terms of any monetary gain that, that came from this. Um, but it's, it's a really politically motivated, um, environment up there and it's not, doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon. You know, I think that they're still killing, you know, anywhere from 20 to 35% of the herd every year. Um, and, you know, the BFC is still doing what they do, which is very much following the bison, counting them, keeping tabs on where they are, what they're doing, uh, if there is any word of a roundup and a culling, uh, what the hazing practices are, you know, a lot of the efforts of the BFC directly translated to changing uh, practices around how bison are managed. Um, so unfortunately, a lot hasn't changed in terms of like drastic protections for wild bison. Um, and I I thought that that was kind of the interesting part at the end of the film of Rick Wallen really speaking to like, you know, there's no better time than now to, if there's a Rockefeller type person out there that can buy huge swaths of land outside Yellowstone, then that's really the best uh, long lasting practice to protect wild bison is to give them more space to roam. And um, I think that they're a very misunderstood animal. You know, I think the viral clips of bison mauling person in Yellowstone is much more a person error than a, a bison error because they're, you know, one, two ton animals and like you shouldn't go up and try to pet it and take a selfie with it. Like you're kind of asking to get gored, in my opinion, in that circumstance. So um, I wish that it would have had a deeper impact in terms of actually changing legislation or acquisition of, of more land for bison to roam. Cause I think that that is the ultimate realm of the ultimate win of what the film could do is to open up more grazing lands for wild bison. Um, and that's built on the, the foundation that, you know, we don't have healthy prairie lands in the United States anymore. We used to have, you know, amazing, incredible prairie lands at the early parts of European expansion. And so um, if you look at 
especially continental United States right now, the only healthy prairie land is in Yellowstone and the Gardner Basin. And so um, the way that bison interact with the land and uh, curate it and really create a healthy ecosystem has been lost um, from all of the prairie lands and in, in the central US. So um, I wish that I had more kind of uh, heartwarming news of how this film has changed policy around wild bison, but the fact of the matter is that brucellosis, um, elk hunting, cattle industry, as well as three governing bodies, not including the federal government, is there's just a lot of different cooks in the kitchen. So to get anything done at, at the court level really takes a huge lift, um, not only energy to, to curate those court cases and take them to trial, um, but also just the monetary cost. And Mike joked with us while we were there that luckily they've graduated a lot of BFC alumni that ended up going into law school. So they have a lot of donated um, time from them. So they have the resources there and they're very much the tip of the sword when it comes to fighting for bison, not only you know boots on the ground out in the field, but also in the courtrooms. And ultimately to change that management style around wild bison, there's really gotta be a coming to terms of truth and not truth because using brucellosis, which is a disease that uh, affects cattle uh, and cattle fertility and scapegoating bison for that when there's these mass feedings of elk in Idaho uh, during hunting season that is kind of like the brucellosis mixer, if you will, um, is really misplaced and used as a way to um, treat bison, you know, much differently than any, you know, endangered species that was protected in that, that time that Yellowstone was founded with those 23 original bison. Um, it's just, a, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's an ongoing battle that I see happening for decades, just because it comes down to public lands and it comes down to big dollars within the Department of Livestock and, um, that's kind of part of the biggest, I guess, heartbreaking part of the story is that it's um, it's not looking like it's going to change anytime soon, but, but that definitely has not, um, you know, affected the people that are really on the ground um, protecting wild bison, which is the Buffalo Field Campaign. Yeah, yeah, thank you. There are a couple of other, there are a couple of things that came to mind for me there, and one of those was earlier in this winter's webinar series, we did a webinar with um, John Muir Laws, who is um, a naturalist, and we did a webinar with him um, about curiosity and the outdoors and creativity and how those things relate. And one of the things that he said that really stuck with me is that you fight for the places you love. And, you know, thinking about this film and in that context and thinking about, you know, the number of people who go to Yellowstone National Park, you know, curious about your thoughts of um, how a film like this that is difficult, right? We're facing our, we're facing history, we're facing the present, we're facing management decisions and people's lives that are, for me, it's difficult to look at, right? Look at this, this, this really challenging situation and being in a place where maybe you don't feel like you can affect change. You've done this work to create a film that helps bring this um, to more people's eyes and to our awareness. And I'm curious what you think about, you know, that power of helping people learn more so that they can do more. I mean, what do you think um, in terms of, you know, folks who watch the film, what are some thoughts you have on, you know, what they can do, what we can do to affect any kind of change? Or even, you know, if we can't affect change, can we support BFC? You know, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely point back to the Buffalo Field Campaign in terms of the most up-to-date um, information and activism that's going on. Um, I think that for me, um, stagnation has always been the greatest fear of like, if you're not swimming in a direction, then like start swimming in a direction. And even if it's the wrong direction, then start swimming in a different direction later. But 
not making a decision, I think is ultimately the most dangerous thing. And if, if you really want to make change, I think it comes down to uh, the intent that's behind it, um, what your end goal is, um, what you see, you know, your art doing, if that is the path of change that you're taking. Um, but I think that we're living in a time that it doesn't have to be this grand thing that's creating a film or, you know, I think just showing up for the causes that you care about, um, listening to people that you don't necessarily agree with um, are all pieces of that change that I think really heart back to uh, if you're doing something that is what you would classify as a passion project, then the goal should really be to give more than you're taking. Thank you. All right, let's see. I'm gonna take a look at my list of questions, Sean. Okay. Okay, so um, I think I wanna to start to shift directions here to a, you know, a little different topic. And then we'll, then we'll go pick up some of the questions in the chat. And um, what I wanna ask you about next is you know, sort of your background as a man who grew up here in Mount Shasta, grew up outdoors and certainly pursued the outdoors. And to talk a little bit about, you know, like that process and, and, um, and I think, you know, on a personal level for you, the selection of this is a passion project, right? Like you, you could have, you could have selected anything as a passion project. How do you see, you know, growing up here, growing up in the outdoors as sort of leading to where you are now in your passion projects and your personal work. And, um, and if you feel like that relates to your professional work too. Yeah, so that path was, uh, you know, rooted in probably my father at the beginning of getting me on the river at a very young age, um, rafting, that transcended into getting a used white water hard shell kayak when I was 13 uh, and very much had years in there that I was very scared to be on the river and didn't want anything to do with it and then kind of hit the ground running once I uh, got involved with white water kayaking and then we had a very strong uh, community here in Shasta and Siskiyou of, of really talented kayakers and they took me under the, their wing and and you know, really lended the guidance to develop quickly and, and love uh, being on the river. And, you know, that developed into uh, early sponsorships when I was 15 and started competing when I was 16 in whitewater kayaking. Ended up meeting a kayak academy at one of those competitions that I then, you know, lobbied extremely hard to my dad to let me go and, and be a part of this academy that very much was about training junior uh, champion whitewater kayakers. And we traveled uh, all over South America and the West Coast. Uh, and those uh, relationships and experience of graduating from world-class uh, then lended itself to locking in some early sponsorships with a tiny little camera company at the time, which was GoPro. And you know, this was a company of two people at the time, Nick Woodman, his wife, uh, and then a few of our other friends that jumped in there shortly thereafter, Justin Wilkenfeld, Rick Lowry. Um, and so that ended up being one of my early sponsors, you know, in 2016. And uh, that really provided what I would call the, the foundation to all of the experiences that would follow that, which was, um, you know, traveling to Canada to kayak to Japan right after the Fukushima disaster um, for a relief mission along with a, a kayaking trip. Uh, and then that led to film school at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and then that led to me having this realization that you know your shelf life as a professional whitewater kayaker is very short and uh, having a game plan of what that looks afterwards. And so um, with that foresight, I was making a choice to take an internal media position as an editor at GoPro. So I went from the athlete side into the internal media side. And then that's where I really cut my chops on the, the editing block of, of video editing, um, shooting, directing, uh, and moving that all the way into a creative director role for the brand partnerships division. And that team um, and relationships after I left GoPro in 2016 
really provided the the foundation for my business, um, which specializes in in brand content, uh, primarily in documentary film. And so uh, it was a process of the relationships from kayaking, from film school, from GoPro, uh, that really wrapped themselves all together that have led to where I'm at now. Um, And, you know, working closely with large Fortune 500 brands, MasterCard, uh, GoPro, Red Bull, um, a lot in the action sports space still, which I, I have a lot of love for. But the intent and the purpose behind it um, was a lot different and uh, a challenging thing to navigate because I think that a lot of that purpose in my kayaking career was very uh, centered around just myself and wanting to do fun things and seeing the opportunities. And I think once I had a little bit more perspective and could look back at it a little bit, it was like, okay, well, that was a lot of fun and beautiful, but ultimately like what stories do you want to tell and how do you want to tell them and who do you want to tell them with? Um, So now it's very much been working with people that uh, creatively inspire me and, and work with people that, you know, have a vision and have capabilities that complement my own that like, I think during my kayaking career was like, look at everything I can do and I can do it all myself versus realizing that if you really want to make something great, especially in film, like it's going to hundred percent be determined by the people around you. Um, and really mm-hmm. recognizing what you're good at and what you're not that good at. And then reaching out to people that are, are a lot better in those spaces than you are and recognizing what you bring to the table. And also that like, if you're hesitant or standoffish at inviting those people in to help and to admit that you need help, then your art and filmmaking is always going to be uh, handicapped in some regards, just because you can't, uh, you can't, you can't do it all yourself. And it comes to a point that you really have to reach out to your community and the people that you look up to in that space to, to kind of complement what you're trying to do. And ultimately that's why filmmaking is this collaborative art that um, you really have to get comfortable with criticism and comfortable that what you're putting forward isn't the best version it's just the first version and it's okay to move on to the next and the next and the next to get that refined vision that has everybody's influence and creativity involved Mm -hmm. thanks for sharing that i love you know that thread of relationships which i think is just so true certainly true in the work that the land trust does and even in this day and age of social media platforms, I think, you know, true still. Um, So a couple of things next. Um, I think I want to start with what's next for the last wild bison. You talked about the plans you you had, you and David had before COVID, and and we've heard a little bit about the impacts of COVID, but what's, what's the trajectory look like for the film? Yeah, so we... I signed the deal with Roku and Tubi uh, beginning of last year, I believe. So it's been available to stream for about the last year. Um, In terms of a distribution strategy outside of it just being available for anybody to watch that wants to see the film, um, it's, you know, we have flirted with doing another one. It's even that leaving my mouth is is hard because that it was such a challenging process to just do a 30 minute film that you know Mike was like so stoked on the film that he's like well nobody's told the entire story of the Buffalo Field campaign and I'm like please not me like I've just watched such the gnarliest archive footage that the BFC has that you know watching that type of content over and over is really hard so I'm not ruling it out that we could do something again with the BFC um what I would really love is you know, it, I think it stays the same course of that. It, it really comes down to people seeing the film that have the resources and um, heart that really care about what's happening out there, right? Because I still believe that outside of changing legislation around wild bison, the the only other route to minimize the hazing and um, lack of tolerance for bison is going to be land acquisitions outside of the park you know and there are large pieces of land outside the park that are for sale um but you know like rick says like a a rockefeller type strategy it would take that type of 
money to come in and really advocate for bison. So um, I, you know, it, it was a hard pill to swallow when the film got rejected by so many film festivals. I was like, you know, this story and the effort and, you know, all the people involved, like this definitely has that potential, but I think seeing those avenues close was just kind of this realization that we're like, okay, well, how do we still share it with as many people as we can? And right now that's streaming, um, you know, it would be nice to do in-person showings and show it in a theater and have that kind of completion, if you will. Um, but it is, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that, that hasn't drastically changed. And, um, there is a piece of that that I'm not going to totally rule out uh, a follow-up. Um, obviously, I haven't talked to David or any of the other pieces in there involved. That's just off the top um, of a, a possibility. But um, yeah, I think that in my mind, I had to kind of take it across the finish line and then kind of let go of it because a passion project you know, it's the kind of classic quote of that, like, films are never completed, they're abandoned, which was like, mm -hmm. I mean, it resonates so true to pretty much anything that I do in the film world. You get to a point that you're like, this is great. This sucks. I don't know. I just want to get rid of it. Um, and this was very much like we spent so much time making sure that it was the best piece that we could put out with the story that we wanted to tell um, with the footage that we have. And I think that that um, letting something go and letting it be complete and it's existence is there's beauty in that and there's not necessarily this isn't a, a project to make money this is a project to share so ultimately it's going to be how do we continue to to share the film and get it in front of people that care and and really try to uplift the communities out there as well as um, the indigenous communities that were obviously the direct target of bison management and still to this day if you look at how we managed and isolated indigenous peoples and native tribes, it's very much represented within that same isolation of bison and Yellowstone. So taking this, you know, these incredible peoples that used to live in every part of North America and then being, you know, here's your tiny little plot of land that you can't grow food on and there's no resources and you can't live off the land um, is kind of that forced forced genocide. I mean, it might be a little bit too aggressive of a word, but I think in the context of what we're talking about, like it is very much, that's what bison were used for. You know, the genocide of bison was the genocide of indigenous peoples because that was their lifeblood. That's what they lived off of. So um, long story short, where is this film going? I think that it's already gone there in all honesty. And uh, if it, if we have an opportunity to show it locally and get people together and, you know, have, have a sharing of that art, that's beautiful. And if it lives how it is now, then that's totally okay as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask you is given your, given your experience with this project, with this passion project, what are your thoughts or feelings about the next passion project? and how those how those arise or the timing or what you might think about you know the next time that a great idea comes to you comes through you and you know what you might think about pursuing that yeah i mean i think it's terrifying <laughs> to think about the next passion project in all honesty just because of how many uh challenging moments this one had um you know, when I look to my own creativity and what I'm really passionate about right now, it's what's going on locally. And I, I was able to do some volunteer work with Friends of the River, um, with the Wintu tribe down outside of Redding, um, east of Redding around Round Mountain and, and meet with Chief, Chief Sisk and, and hear a lot of Kayleen's uh, story and what, what's happened with the, the local tribes here and, and the history behind that. Um, I don't exactly know, you know, which I think is like the, biggest faux pas of a filmmaker is to not have the next project on deck that you're you're striving towards and I think that a lot of that is I'm in a place right now that I'm just trying to work and kind of recoup the the funds that were invested into producing and creating this film um, what the next one will be you know I think that 
I look to a lot of the people around me of, you know, who wants to collaborate and who's telling stories that have depth and have purpose outside of um, elevating ego or, uh, you know, not not doing something for the right reason. And that's kind of what's ultimately driving me now is like, if I'm going to donate time and commit time into a passion project, then it's got to be for the right reasons. And it's a very challenging thing to do because to keep a passion project, a passion project, you're, you know, basically putting forward that you're not taking brand money, that you're not taking outside executive producers, you're financing it yourself to ultimately keep that creative freedom. Um, and in my mind, I'm, I'm excited to tell more stories about you know, wild animals and what, what, what's happened to indigenous peoples, uh, what's happening to climate and our environment of what we're seeing just here locally in Siskiyou of, you know, I don't remember a winter on record that mid-March we're heading towards 75 degree weather. Um, the lack of snowpack, the lack of water in our rivers, uh, the salmon die off on the Klamath, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on just right here in Siskiyou that are is very concerning, and you know I can't go outright and say that I'm going to be pursuing a, a documentary film on any of those singular things, but I think it's a, a shift in what I am finding um, rewarding and fulfilling in terms of my storytelling right now, because I think my day to day of working with some of the biggest brands in the world is is great, and I'm learning a lot of stuff, and it's paying bills. Uh, in terms of the fulfilling side of it, of giving back, of telling stories that matter, um, sometimes it aligns, but in terms of a passion project, it, it really hits home of like this level of purity that you're trying to keep it in, which is a very challenging thing to do. So I'm, I'm hesitant to be like, this is the next big project. Um, I have a few different ideas, um, a lot based around local stuff going on, uh, mountain biking, uh, cattle, uh, obviously what's going out in Chastain and A12, uh, the Klamath. I think all of these things are intersecting um, and it's not to point fingers or, or blame any of the parties. It's more that all the different factors in play right now are kind of leading us into this uh, very dismal and, and sad future of resource extraction and not this balance of recognizing what's there and that, you know, there's no backpedaling once the Klamath runs dry and we saw it with the Shasta River of, you know, one of the largest tributaries running dry last year and then the massive juvenile die off that happened over there, which has only happened one other time in my lifetime. So um, right now I'm really trying to see what what I can do here locally, as well as just, um, you know, build build my own business and see, you know, who the other creatives and, and people are out there that want to make something and collaborating because I think um, the idea that I'm going to just have all these great ideas is not realistic when the reality that this great idea came from a collaboration of people. It was not, none of this would have happened without David. None of this would have happened without the Buffalo Field campaign and their archive footage. It wouldn't have happened without Josh donating his time. It wouldn't have happened without Jason donating his time. So um, when it really comes down to it, I think the next passion project is going to have some flow to it and it's going to come at a time that I'm not necessarily expecting it but I think the team will align um, and that's what's going to ultimately spark the interest for the next passion project is that it's going to have the people um, involved that I feel like I can learn and grow and, and develop my own creativity from. Nice thank you I really appreciate hearing about your orientation towards your creative process and towards working collaboratively collaboratively and how important that is in that creative process. So thank you for that. Um, I am going to stop sharing the screen now and move us on to questions because we've got um, a fair few of them lined up. Let me find the beginning. Um, question from Donna. She asked, do you think the film festival rejections had anything to do with this being a politically charged issue? Um, I'd like to think not, but you know, it, who knows in those processes, like, especially in the most elite film festivals, um, getting in solely off of your merit and with no connection to the festival is like very rarely done. Um, I don't think that it was necessarily politically motivated. I think a lot of it had to do that. I was like, oh, 
we're coming out of COVID, like nobody's going to have a film. It was quite the opposite of like everybody had films, like everybody went into this COVID editing cave and came out with something. Um, so that part didn't lend itself that every festival that we applied to had record numbers of submissions. Um, I don't think I would ever blame it on it being politically motivated. You know, I think that every art can be refined into a place that it, it does um, tell a, a story that hasn't been heard that resonates with a lot of people. Um, but ultimately, I, I think that it didn't get in because ultimately it didn't resonate with the people that were watching it. And it, you know, it's, it's a, a stepping stone. And, you know, if I look at the videos and films that I created when I was 18 to 25, uh, it kills me. It's like literally, it, it pulls out my heartstrings to see how terrible they were. So I think that this ultimately didn't get into those festivals because they are the most prestigious festivals in the world. Um, and ultimately, the art wasn't there yet. And I think that that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's also if you can't uh, absorb and receive rejection and use that to move into whatever the next phase is, then you're just gonna live in that. And ultimately, I didn't see those closed doors as like a failure. I saw them more as a necessity to get to those streaming platforms that are in every household in the world. So even though it broke my heart that it didn't get in there uh, and it wasn't successful in the festival scene, I know that that was the path to get us to Roku and on Apple TV and Amazon Fire Stick and all the major streaming platforms that now, not only is it, you know, if you don't have money to go to this festival, you're not going to see it, but it's open to everyone, you know, and that I think was a big part for me and David of wanting this to be accessible and not to have a class barrier or a monetary barrier of people not being able to enjoy the art because they can't afford it. Yeah, so many, so many decisions that go into, um, you know, how you make this and then how you choose to share it. Um, let's see, another question. And, uh, and I will say before, before I pose this question to Sean, that um, Last Wild Bison has a Facebook page, and there are some videos there of, you know, some, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing. So Sean, the question is, how did the buffalo react to being filmed? And, um, and specifically the question, like, how far away were you from them? Yeah, so I think that I, you know, was really intimidated by them at first when you see them and you're like, these animals are huge and they can crush you with a head swipe. Um, it, it really, you know, they are like us. They're sentient beings that very much can tell what your intent is. They feel your energy the same way that my dog knows I'm sad before I'm sad, you know, they detect the pheromones and, and what you're giving off. So I think myself and David, Josh in the field very much were coming uh, from a place of wanting to share their story and, and coming from a place of pure intent and not trying to harm them. Um, so, you know, we got within 10 feet, maybe closer. I don't know. I mean, there was, times that we were hanging out with the central herd that I was using a long lens just to be less intrusive to them so that they could feel safe and do what they were going to do. Um, there was other times that Josh was running outside with a gimbal, like through the, the bushes right by a big bull. And we're like, he might get splattered. He might be okay. And luckily he was fine. And, um, you know, they were very tolerant of us, but I think that that we with cameras um, we're carrying a lot different energy when people roll up with horses and ATVs um, and kind of some of that equipment that they associate with the haze so mm. like anything I like horses like I think that they can smell and feel your energy and they can be like you know these guys are here to be part of the herd or these guys are here to do harm and very much we always approached it from a conservative perspective of like you know watch them keep your eye on them if their energy shifts and their attitude towards you shifts or you see the bull move into a different position or a mom with a calf like um there was a good amount of common sense that had to go where you know what what a safe distance would be and that you know was a moving target but i think it really came down to the intent that we had there and the realization that the bison could feel that we weren't there to to mess with them or or do any harm mm -hmm. 
you know, that makes me think about some of the shots, the still shots that you shared tonight. Did you at any point place cameras, GoPros like on the ground? You know, some of those shots where, you know, the nose, the bison is right in the camera. How did you make those happen? Yeah, so I mean, GoPro gave us cameras for for the trip, kind of no strings attached, just for, you know, I've, I've worked with them for so long that they wanted to support us. Uh, obviously, that gave us these opportunities to really uh, ingrain, you know, those experiences with the buffalo. So you don't feel like you're really a spectator anymore, but you're actually, you know, a piece of grass being eaten or, you know, getting breathed on by, by bison. So um, I think that not only gopros 360 cameras but also them as a drop cam where we could set cameras where we could see the herd was moving uh, and then just kind of sit back and, and watch what was going on um, was really uh, instrumental in us getting some of the shots that we got and that was a combination of myself and, and david you know drop it was kind of all hands on deck when we were hanging with the herd of everybody be capturing something um, but very much i think that that's what gopro does so well is that they capture experiences and um, environments and dialogue even uh, that you really don't capture on other cameras. Because if you're rolling up there with a DSLR setup or a RED or something that is much more intrusive, it's just different than um, a tiny little camera that is barely noticed, you know? So seeing some of those shots uh, of the drop cams and, and the bison just kind of rolling through uh, was a really special aspect of the film and, and one that I don't think we would have been able to achieve without those uh, GoPros and, um, you know, just spending time with, with the bison. But that that's a pretty uniquely GoPro thing that I've seen across multiple different uh, media types is that they tend to capture these interactions, whether animal or people that other cameras don't capture because you more or less forget that they're there. And so you can let your guard down um, versus when most people pull a camera out and have a camera in somebody's face, you can watch somebody go from like a totally rational human to like a total weirdo in like a second. And you're like, how did that happen so quickly? Because I'm usually not this strange, but now there's a camera and I'm gonna say a bunch of stuff I would never say. So. Um, I think that GoPro aspect of that intimate connection that the camera provides um, was really special in Last Wall Bison and, and ultimately led to those really um, dynamic drop cams where you're just hanging out with the bison. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see. So Parker asks, have you considered applying or reapplying for some of the local festivals such as the Ashland Independent Film Festival or the Wild and Scenic Film Festival? I have considered it. I'd say I'm still, you know, licking my wounds a bit from the other festivals. And, and now that it's out, um, once you release a film, uh, obviously festivals are more inclined to take films that it's their world premiere versus if it's already out and available and monetized on platforms. So um, not impossible. Um, Ashland, we did apply to. That was one of the 12 that we got rejected to. So um, we and that was because specifically that we applied to the main entry, not the local filmmaker entry. And that was based off of wanting to put it up against the best of the best. And, you know, there's a chance that we could resubmit it for the local side. Um, not guaranteed that we would get in by any means. Wild and scenic, uh, it's it's possible, you know, there's some, some festivals have caps on when you can submit content of like when it was created in. So given this was created 20, shot in 2018, really brought to life in 2020. Um, it's kind of getting to a point that resubmitting it might not work in terms of the timing constrictions that you're required to adhere to within the festival scene. So um, I'm not married to it. I mean, it could be that I'm jaded. It could be just where I see media and content going in the future, but I don't see festivals really surviving in my opinion in terms of where um, media streaming accessibility is going. Like, I think that there might always be a space for those, you know, Sundances and Tribeca's and, and the best of the best. But I think for what, you know, especially when it comes to independent filmmaking, it's going to be a much more grassroots kind of bootstrap, like bootstrap scrappy type of distribution, similar to what we had that if you want your project to get out, um, it's really got to be through one of these other platforms and having a strategy around it. And by all means, like our strategy was as imperfect as it could be. Um, and that's 
kind of how it's usually associated with a passion project, unless you have a budget that's really financing all the things you want to do. The bottom line is that, you know, for those 12 to 15 festivals, that was like 1500 bucks, you know, that you're basically lighting on fire and throwing out the window. So in the perspective of what that money could be used for and what it would be the most benefit to um, festival submissions uh, is kind of dropping on the list of what I would see as like a productive and um, where I see the future of content going, which is much more in a, a streaming, um, live stream, online platform based, like OTT platform type of uh, situation, whether it's iTunes or whether it's, you know, obviously we had another film of local filmmaker and friend and Rush, he, he obviously just had his film on Netflix, which is kind of this big um, gap for, especially an action sports film, um, which you guys should all check out. It's called River Runner and it's up there. But um, I think that that idea, um, there's some pieces that are gonna transcend that space like Rush's film that is doing well in festivals as well as on a streaming platform. Um, but I think where it's going in the next 10 years is gonna be a lot more, um, do you want it to be, do you want the accolades at a film festival um, for whatever the end goal is, or do you want to share it far and wide and for as many people as want to see it? And that's the priority versus like, how do we make money for it? Because if you're going to Netflix, if you're going to festivals, it is for feathers in the cap, as well as ultimate somebody buying out the film uh, to make money from it. So I think you just got to be clear on your objectives and what you want to do with your art. And if you want to make money from your art, then there's a path for that. And if you want to get as many people to see it as you possibly can, then that's a different route. Okay, thanks for sharing that. And that leads me to the next question, which I think is also our wrap up question. Um, let's talk about different ways that people can see the film. The link, the Vimeo link, someone noted it comes up as a private film and maybe we need a password there, but that's not the only way that people can see it. So uh, let's talk about some of those other ways that people can access the film. Uh, we're available on Roku um, streaming service, as well as the Tubi app. Tubi is available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick. Um, most smart TVs come with that app already pre-installed. If not, you can usually search it within the app store, uh, T-U-B-I, and then that'll come up, download it, search Last Wild Bison, it'll pop up and you can watch it on there. It does have ads on that platform as well as Roku. Um, outside of that, you can watch it on Tubi.com through their browser extension. So you can just watch it on the internet uh, that way. Uh, and if none of those work, just drop me an email and we'll give you a private link and you can watch it through Vimeo. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And let's see, Kim, um, Kim just posted a link to Tubi. So we've got that there. Um, I think we have one last question from Donna. So I'll go ahead and ask that question, Sean, but then uh, we'll wrap it up for the evening. And what she asked about is... Um, if you can speak to um, the cooperation from Yellowstone National Park um, regarding the filming, like what did that relationship look like? Yeah, I mean, cooperation might be bold. I think the only cooperation we had was because we paid for a permit and then <laughs> they had to do it. So I think that that would be the only cooperation that we had was that we, we paid for our permit. We set up um, comms with Rick Wallen. Uh, and then we made that happen. I, I think that the um, process of, of how uh, the park, you know, as long as you have that permit and your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted, it doesn't really matter. Like there's a lot of uh, requirements around filming the thermal areas of the park. There's specific uh, locations that you can't go without additional permits. So it was kind of just navigating the, the red tape and the red lines of around like what we could do, what we couldn't do, and then uh, what we just did and hope that we didn't get in trouble for. So that's kind of the way that we rolled is ask for forgiveness and, you know, pay for our, our permit to, to have cameras and be, be in the environment to not you know, be, be totally trampling on the rules, but then also recognizing that the story that we were telling is <laughs> inherently somewhat rebellious and ultimately it came down to us wanting to show the best footage of the park and none of it was to trample on, you know, very sensitive ecosystems or anything like that. We, we respected all the thermal zones and didn't have tripods in them. And so I'd say ultimately the park 
was cooperative, uh, but I think that that was in the context of them not knowing the film that we're making and not knowing the story that we're telling and not that it sheds totally negative light on Yellowstone. I don't think that that's what it really does, but um, that cooperation is purely governmental, which if you want to play, you got to pay. And that's kind of how it is in the national parks is pay for your permit, be as descriptly nondescript as you can about what you're doing, and then you pretty much have free reign. All right. Well, thanks for answering the last question. And I really want to thank you, Sean, for spending time with us tonight. It's been great to hear about the creative process and to hear about, you know, so much of the consideration that went into not only how you told the story, but also how you chose to share it. And I really appreciate that view into the creative world. And, um, and so um, to wrap us up for the evening, I want to thank you all for being here and joining us tonight. And Sean, thanks so much for sharing the story, the film, the journey. Really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll see you out on a trail soon. Yeah, no, thank you all for having me. And if you guys are looking for a way to donate to the Buffalo Field Campaign, you can purchase these teas uh, from Kind Humans. I'm going to drop a link. Uh, in the chat right now and all of that is donated to the BFC so um, rad bamboo organic cotton and then uh, that donation goes directly to the BFC from kind humans so if you're looking for a way to you know have have some sort of an involvement and be stoked about the film that's one route um, to benefit the Buffalo Field campaign and the activism that they're still doing down on the ground to protect wild bison so Thank you all for having me and elevating the story and yeah, look forward to the next one. All right. Thanks, Sean. Good night, everyone. Hey, y'all.